Hit the road, Jack. <laughs> so why does the Altarebbe make this long bureau an explanation? Why is it so important? Because otherwise we can't understand what what it means. Hakitzakata. What does it mean that he asked her to see if her outcry? Who is this her? He's not really explained. What? He said it. He said it's the midas adin, but he didn't explain how the whole process works. So now he's explaining. You're asking. Are you asking like why is this important in Because this is very. Is the ever right th- this to changes a lot in terms of. Sitting. What's in the Torah? Oh, can you read? It's very, very important. So, so first of all, the the Alter Rebbe didn't write the Haggah, the Tzemach did. Okay. But, but it's interesting, like you said, that he 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 probably heard from him that that the the way that the Ramak says it is. Again, I don't think that he is anything. The, the Reed doesn't, from what I remember, I don't remember it well. I didn't have time to look it off again. The Reed doesn't say anything essentially different. It's just much more complex. But. What it really changes is the way you understand your role in the world. Because uh, I was talking to my professor friend yesterday. We always take a walk in the afternoon for 15 yeah, minutes. What happened to our morning walk? <laughs> Why have you stopped? <laughs> I've been there. You haven't come. What? I still take it. You just uh, you're not there. When are you going to go to walk tomorrow? When are we learning? 8:30. 8:30. So at 8:10. Okay. You may be there. Anyway, um, so he told me that every time he teaches the sugya of God's omniscience and man's free will, uh, people are shocked. Why are they shocked? Because most people don't think that man has free will. I mean, they experience free will, but they don't think it really matters. I think that most people don't understand the concept of free will. Maybe. Because it doesn't work out. Oh my, how can you say that I've got choice? Whether I want to, whether I don't want to, you stand up and bop you on the nuts, right? Complete free choice. Yeah, the shame knows what I'm going to do before I do it, when I do it, and after I do it. So, it, you know, has to show me she bop you on the nuts. But, you know, the, the, so the whole concept of how it works is strange. I accept it. Okay. So he's, gonna, he's trying to explain it. But hopefully, the result of learning this is that you lower the defense mechanism called I have no free choice. It's really a defense mechanism because you know you have it. I like the Rambam's example. You know the Rambam's example. Which one? Man is sitting in a tree. He's completely hidden. He's sitting very close to the edge of a cliff. There's a guy walking down a path, totally oblivious to what he's doing, and his dog's running on ahead. Somebody runs to chase after his dog. So if the guy sitting in a tree knows that one second the guy's going to fall over the cliff and be dead, he didn't make him do it. The guy had free will. He could choose whether he wanted to. So the fact that the observer knows what's going to happen doesn't take away the person down below his free will to decide what he's going to do. Tim, but here we're saying that Hashem's involvement in the world is much more than just knowing. That would be the scientific point of view. Rambam's very scientific, he's very shtalshalist. So when Hashem set the world in motion, he knows everything that's going to happen. That's not the Hasidic point of view. Because Though you may know exactly what's going to happen, your knowledge really doesn't affect anything. But according to Hasidus, the fact that you know has to also affect things. Especially because you're, you have, you're guiding or you're using your knowledge to guide the individual. Hashgacha pratis means guidance. It doesn't just mean that I know what you're doing. Hashem is guiding me. He's, he's in a dialogue with me. So that's a much more complex picture to uphold. It's harder to give a, a, an explanation that would satisfy the rational mind and say that on the one hand, Hashem knows and is engaged, and the other hand, I still have free will. That's very difficult to do, and that's what he's trying to do. But again, the uptake of it, I think, is that it helps you lower this defense mechanism. There's a defense mechanism that we all have built, built in which is that when I do something negative, I didn't do it. <laughs> I have no free will. What, me, what? I want it's your fault, <laughs> Hashem. You set the world in motion. You gave me this. Ah, da, 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 da. It's your fault. Somebody else is to blame. The woman that, you gave me, gave me that. that's, that's a defense mechanism. It's a defense mechanism because I know it's not true. 
So why am I doing it? Because it's too heavy to carry the burden of knowing that I chose to do something wrong. I, I, it's too heavy for me to carry the burden of knowing that the way my life looks is because of the choices I made and not because... You gave me those genes. I didn't choose. Can, right. So, so it, science doesn't really say one way or the other, but certainly science has an impossible time upholding a picture of God being engaged. He can, Science can uphold a picture of God knowing, but it can't uphold one where he's engaged. This is what Hasidus is trying to do. That's you said something yesterday, which has distressed and disturbed <laughs> me much more than that. Okay. This is what it sounded like to me. Right? The Hashem says there's certain things that you're supposed to do, they're called mitzvahs. There's certain things that you're not supposed to do, that's a different type of mitzvah. So Hashem looks down and sees that you are not doing a mitzvah, or you're doing something which you're not supposed to do. He says, okay, never mind, Now, if it's a shame's if the world is based on Jews doing Torah and mitzvahs, how can it not matter if a Jew doesn't keep a uh, uh, commandment? How can it not matter if a Jew in the middle of South America goes and eats trays? I don't remember saying anything any like that. The closest thing I remember saying to that as I said, the Malbim says that before Avraham there was no individual reckoning. There was no individual engagement. Amen. But the moment that Avraham comes up, and this is what the Rambam also says, and he, I don't know how he upholds it, if he does it very well or not. The moment that there is a tzaddik in the world, that's what the Malbim seems to, seems to be saying, and that fits very well with the, with with joining together the Rambam and Hasidus and the Baal Shem Tov, is that the moment that there is a tzaddik in the world, the moment that there is a righteous individual who does have this personal relationship, everybody in the world can potentially have their relationship. Okay, so that's the Nosi Adol. Okay. Yeah, but you said the words that if a certain Jew doesn't do a mitzvah, then the Shem can just say, okay, we said this, so it's all right. Just I'm not as going far to... as the Dina Rafia is concerned, yes. But how can that be? Should In the same way that people smoke and nothing happens to them. Because the Dina Rafia is not individualized. But mitzvahs are not gashmias. They sound like ruchmi. Why not? Right. Mitzvahs are very gashmias. They're a connection to Hashem. They have to be but, they're, but they're physical. They're physical actions. Okay, so a person gets in his car, drives on Shabbos, then he, he is going against what Hashem wants. Nahon. But, yeah. Malchus. So... But that's, again, the question is whether it's Dina de Melchuta Dina, or whether it's the individual, I'll now turn my head and look at you. Really, that's the Pasuk that it all starts from. The Shem's looking at all of us all the time. Again, so, so, so that's what he says here, that there are two stages. <laughs> said of it, he says there are two stages. There's the Dina de Melchuta Dina, Melech be Mishpati Amidaritz, that the king has some clout in his kingdom, but he's not individually looking at each individual, and he's not in a dialogue with each individual and deciding his fate. That's the general din, so that there's order in the world, so the world is not a toss-up entirely, or free for, for all. But then there's what he says here, the, the second stage of din, which is when Hashem comes down, as it were. And, it's a, and, and that, again, is a, is a metaphor for Hashem in clothing Himself within the measure of din that goes through, the measure of judgment that goes through the sefirot. I mean, per se, it's a strange thing that you say that Hashem comes down. No, no. no. So that's why it's, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. We, don't, we never get hung up by the metaphors. We're not at that stage. <laughs> Omnipoetic metaphor. It's a what? Omnipoetic. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. There's many metaphors. and It doesn't really matter. In the end, each one serves its purpose. But don't get hung up on it. Just accept that it's a metaphor for something. The question is for what? Okay. So here we're saying that he's enclosing his knowledge within the vessels of of the Sfirot. So how do you reconcile with David Amela saying, Achet tamid That's me. That's my problem. That's from my point of view. No, nobody sure does this. Can of course, but he he is not forgiven himself. 
Not because he's, he says, this Ram hasn't forgiven me. Because he's no, he knows that he's always prone to sinning again. Not about the past. Okay. And we talked about this many times. It's, that's his shiftless. That's his lowliness. That he knows that I am capable of any type of sin. There's nothing new. If I would sin, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd be upset, but I wouldn't be surprised. That is what he, that's the takeaway message from Hashem forgiving me. It's gone as far as Hashem is concerned, but it shouldn't be gone as far as I'm concerned. Not to hold me uh, with feelings of guilt or shame, but with feelings of, I am prone to sin. So what happens with the video? The video. You don't know the video? No. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, hmm. And then they call all his family, and they'll sit down and sit down. And they'll watch the video of his life, right? And they see the good things in the back. If he did something bad, and he does chew what happens to the video at that point? Blank space? No, it's amazing. Look, he did something negative. Yeah. He did tshuva. Wow, everybody claps their hands, because it's a good ending. Yeah. And then it turns out, as you watch the video for another 20 years after he passed away, yeah. that that negative thing that he did yeah. actually had very good consequences in the, in the future, which he couldn't foresee. That's all. You see that in the end, it, work, it not only is an amazing comeback by the hero, it also caused good ripples in the world, causing positive things later on. There are some things which is almost impossible to understand how could you possibly have a positive outcome from a negative. Huh. Man walks into a restaurant, uh, and walks into a restaurant. To understand that, you have to take a little, a smaller picture. A guy coming to another a person who's, who's, who's unconscious on the table, with a knife. You know that metaphor. <laughs> you know that analogy. Yeah, the Rebbe used it a lot. Right. Because I'm saving his life. Okay. So right now it looks like it's something horrible and terrible and whatever. And if he dies on the operating table, it will be horrible and terrible. But most of the times, most doctors go by Galen's <laughs> vow, which is do no harm. Mm-hmm. First do no harm. So they don't do it if they don't think that they can, that they, they have some chance, very good chances of succeeding. And so, you know, no, nobody's going to operate. Uh, sometimes they do it because the guy really wants it and they want him to feel better so they'll operate on something that they, th- they think is hopeless and most chances are that he'll die, but they want to give him hope and maybe he will. It really depends on the person. But there are plenty of physicians who work that way today with chemotherapy. Right. They know the chemotherapy. It won't work. But they still feel... Because it gives hope. Right. And hope is... Uh, is hope has to get up to the morning and look in the mirror. That too, and hope is about fifty percent as powerful as chemotherapy. Don't agree with you. It's a hundred percent. Ninety percent. No, no. It, the person's, you know. Yeah, no, that for sure. But it, uh, it's part. It's part of the picture. So every doctor knows that. I mean, at least anybody who's in, been in the doctoring business for more than two years, you know, he's seen that. Anyway, okay, let's try to uh, continue here. No, these are very, very, very important points. These are not just stunts. Okay, which, which is why I'm sorry that you don't have a microphone. Why? Because you, it's very hard to hear you on this one. Why so I, I don't know if people can... I can hear you. But they, hear they want to hear the questions. Okay. Okay. You're somewhere down in the Agog. Yeah. Like no, the Agog I actually finished. Uh, oh, no, we're still in the Agog, you're right. Something like about the, towards the end of it. Okay. So we said there are two types of, of knowledge, right? So the earlier knowledge is what's called, now he's, he's saying that when kingdom reflects back an action, that I did something, that's the kata, that he'll say in the end is the tzakata, that's the outcry. But that causes something to happen. It causes the knowledge that Hashem has to shift from what he called the dat elyon, the supernal knowledge, into dat achton. When the outcry comes up, meaning the actions um, are reflected from our reality, and they rise up, like we said, there's angel above angel, it's carried back up into, and really what it means, it's abstracted more and more, till it reaches, in a certain sense, a vessel that's very close to the infinite, and is now holding this action, this uh, impression made by the action, that causes the Ein Sof, which the Ramah calls the Dat, the knowledge, to shift. 
And instead of being dat elyon, supernal knowledge, supernal knowledge, which is something which is unknown to us. Right. It's unknown to us, and it's not, um, it's not uh, engaging. It doesn't engage the world because it's not engarbed in the vessels. So, no, uh, no, all this that is in uh, Atilos, all this is an emanation. It causes it to come down as lower dot, as da which, like which is already actionable, it's already an engagement, meaning it's me knowing you, says Hashem. Now I'm going to know you individually. Okay. Again, He knew me before. But I wasn't a free agent, like I tried to say. I was just a guy flipping the pages, and, and in the end, near the safer, near the book, when the page was torn. My hand, the, the hand also moved, but the attributing guilt, he acted, that that Leon doesn't do. Like you said, it doesn't see anything evil. It just sees the facts. It doesn't make a judgment, moral or otherwise, about the facts. So it sees all the individuals. It's not that it doesn't see them, of course. But it doesn't treat them as free agents. But that achton, lower that, which is already engarbed within the vessels of the Sefirot, does treat the individuals as free agents. And so there, there, there ensues a dialogue between the inf- infinite and between the person. So we did all this. Masha'enken, so it's seven lines from the bottom. Masha'enken, a idea that Kadosh will yodea atid, um, asa adam kodem shenasa, ain no al yadam klal. What God knows the future, like we said, is only with the dat elion, with the supernal knowledge. And there, there is no forcing of the hand of anybody because nobody is a free agent there. This type of knowledge, how Hashem knows the future, actually how He knows all of time, really. Um, you could say that the real difference between past, future, and the present is that in the present, Da'at Achton is functioning. The present moment is where Hashem is applying His lower knowledge. So there is an engagement between. In the past, there is no more engagement. So Hashem cannot change the past, or He can change? He doesn't. He could, of course, but he doesn't. Why would he change it? He could, but he leaves it as it is. Why ruin the movie? I had a plan that's working out. Doing tshuva is changing the past, no? For me, for sure. For that tachton, for how Hashem sees me, yes. So because this knowledge, the supernal knowledge, is makif, it's a surrounding light, it doesn't engage, it does not force the choice. Because man is not excited by it. Or mitpael, we used a better word yesterday. He's not impressed by it. Okay? There's no impression made. And here's a critical point, not so critical for understanding, but a critical for understanding the structure. Dat Elyon is really the dat that's between the intellectual faculties, between wisdom and understanding, between Chochmah and Bina. It has, in fact, it's even described many times as being called Elyon because it's even higher than wisdom and understanding in a certain sense. I want to get into the whole sugi and it's Chaim. He has a whole, whole explanation of how it works. In any case, the point is that it's intellectual. The Yari. No. It's Chaim we have was written by Mayor Papras. Nothing, nothing even related now. But it has the same content. It was basically almost verbatim uh, what Rav Chaim Vital uh, wrote himself and called it Chaim. So the Da'at Elyon is really an intellectual faculty. Da'at Achton is the Da'at that gives birth, or is at least the womb, from within which the measures of the heart come out. That's where they're born from. Da'at Achton affects the heart, the measures, the loving kindness and might, and the Chesek they all come from Da'at. Da'at So, 
it makes an impression. Because when you feel something, that is already a dialogue. That's already intellectual knowledge of something is not yet engaging it. It's just cold in a certain sense. It's not... I'm being a little academic, but you get the idea. But Sachal Vaonish, reward and punishment, that's already a moral judgment. That comes from a moral assessment of things. Was it good or bad, what you did? So that can only happen when there's lower dot. And the vessels of these that dat achton goes through, that the lower dat, lower knowledge, advances and engarbs itself in the world and creates the engagement are called vessels and eyes. And even said before that there's ears and so on. But again, these are all these are all analogies or metaphors. It's not to say there are ears or eyes floating around. We didn't read from this Binyani here he says it exactly that's what he said above. Same thing. He's just saying, you can fit everything I just told you in the Ramak's words. And that's what we did. Uh, so Hashem is looking at the action, he's not just looking at the action, he's looking at everything else around it, every cause and effect and everything, and only then he decides what to do about it. That's what he's saying. Hashem knows everything that happened and will happen. The present moment is Hashem's engagement with that. Mm-hmm. And the present moment is created either by there being a tzaddik, and when there's a tzaddik, not either, but according to the Malbim, when there's a tzaddik, and, or according to the pshad here, is when the katsa kata, where the where the outcry, meaning the reflected light from our actions, becomes so such a din, din in the sense of English din, d i n, resounding voice, right, a sound that you can't ignore, and then Hashem has engages, right? Din means a loud noise. So it's so very interesting. You got, you got to think about that. That din is the is a loud loud sound. It could be that it comes from from here. It probably doesn't. It probably comes from some French word from twelfth century. But it's very interesting. But I love them. <laughs> I love it when that happens. Okay. This is what it says later on in Exodus, in Shmos. When they cried. When they also they cried to Hashem, and He heard. And, or he saw, and he knew. Okay. But here this Yedah Elokim means like Hashem decided no. to do some action. Lower, right, lower knowledge. Until now, he knew, he knew they were in bondage. They, they knew they were in slavery. But the cry had not reached him. So what was the cry? Whose cry was it? So you think, Vayitzaku B'nei Yisrael El Hashem. Mikot Me'avodah Kasha, I remember. But it says that the Bnei Yisrael cried out. So it's very interesting. Here, the crying out was done by the measure of judgment itself. I'm too, I'm, I, I can't carry anymore. <laughs> I'm morally bankrupt. But there's also another type of cry. Suffering. Suffering is also something... Meaning, if it, the Rebbe many times said... This is, um, People asked him, I don't remember what the what the issue was, but whether they should go demonstrate about something. It's not, not about the Russian Jewry, because there he said never to do it, not to do that. Um, I don't remember what the, what the issue was. But the Rebbe said many times, if it doesn't harm, you should go, if it doesn't cause harm, like in the case of Russian Jewry, you should go and demonstrate. And he said, why? It's not, it's not going to make a difference. He said, because when something hurts, you have to cry out. And we, and we talked about this, uh, what's his name, the Australian uh, Shaliach, was very good, Aaron Mas. So he wrote a piece that uh, I remember until this day, because it was very, very moving. 
He said, what's the point of going to a hospital if you can't help the people? What's the point? What's the point of you visiting yeah. people? Yeah, what's the point? To give them hope and encourage them. But you can't help them. But you do help them. Take away some of the pain. First you take away 60 years. But you take away some of the pain just by showing that you can, right? It's something, but you can't help them. <laughs> The real problem they have, you can't help with. Okay. They have that problem that they're alone, and they're, that's also true. It, it, it adds a lot of pain, but the real problem you can't do anything about. It's, it's not true. Any person that cries out because someone else is suffering, even if they can't help them, that changes reality. And you see that in the Parsha, because that's exactly what Avram does about stone. That's exa- he can't help them, but he cries out. He he starts, by the way, well, why by... Why do they care anyway? They were all a bunch of bandits. And still, because pain and suffering of another human being is painful. Because we know that that's pain. We, we can identify with it, even if the other guy's a bandit. <laughs> or worse. You can send me this article? But even, yeah, I'll find it. But even more than that, when Avimelech became sick because of what happened... So Avram here knew not to negotiate. He learned something. You could say that he learned something from the negotiations about Sodom. You just have to cry out. Don't negotiate. <laughs> There's nothing to negotiate well, about. Like Moshe, Miriam, so, but that, that was another 500 no, years later. Same idea, right? Okay, it's the same idea. It was pleased so Moshe Rabbeinu already learned from Avram. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a trial and error process. I tried to negotiate, not much came out of it. At least they saved Lot. That's something, but it's not what Avram wanted. When it came to Avimelech and his family, and his whole palace, I don't know how many people were there, a thousand, two thousand, everybody in the town couldn't go to the bathroom (laughs) for I don't know how many days. And Avram didn't negotiate with Hashem. He just prayed about them. Mm -hmm. Because when it hurts you, that's exactly the reflected light coming back up and saying, Hashem, don't, won't you do judgment? But that's exactly the point, that when Avram talked to Hashem about Sodom, he said the only thing he could awaken was, Hashofet kol ha'aretz lo yase mishpat. He's still working on the, on, the previous, uh, on the previous election. He doesn't know what's going on even. So he's still thinking, it's judgment that brings it up. The Chiddush was that the second time he just asks for mercy, for compassion. And that's a whole different, that's a whole game changer. Because now it's not judgment. Judgment, okay, let's negotiate, let's see. <laughs> and the truth is, they don't have enough merits to save them from what's about to happen. Okay. So that's a, that, that, whole, that he discusses also here. Uh, it's not that God now knew suddenly that the Jewish people were, were in bondage before it was in what we call the supernal knowledge it made no impression that could cause Pharaoh to be punished and cause the Jewish people to receive a reward but through God saw what does it mean he saw as we use this term, the eyes of God, again, the vessels of the Sfirot that came down to engarb the infinite. To see the actions, these actions have already occurred. And it's not that he's seeing something new. Through this, God's knowledge was pulled down, was drawn down, so sometimes lower knowledge is called knowledge that extends into the measures of the heart, into the midos. What? Does it help my gashmish to do it always? When people say don't take it to heart, mm-hmm. what they mean is don't let your knowledge become extended knowledge into the heart. Know what's going on, but don't be affected by it. That, it's almost the same story by the, by the human psyche. 
we also have in a way of knowing things without being okay but without being what would you say the word would be to be me totally you know taking the pieces right no but yeah but it's a better word I can't believe so don't, uh, be don't be affected by what you see but you can't always not be affected sometimes it's too much so the person takes it to heart what does it mean his knowledge goes down to his heart and he feels his blood boiling and he feels his heart racing and he feels his whole body tre- trembling that's exactly what's going on it's a, it's the same thing in a person we also have that in and that tachton the Rebbe Rashab dedicates almost a full volume to explaining the different aspects of that Th- these two being very eter ein tafresh tafresh ein whatever it's called eter and and it's a pretty big volume a long time ago, but I don't remember anything from it. The takeaway was, he discussed every single type of dot you could think of. <laughs> that, that was the takeaway for me. Okay. So, this is the process. Uh, it says in the, in the future, that will be revealed. And Yosef saw this, this which, which is why he could see the future. That he's above the eye. The literal meaning of the bracha. That it's exactly why, why do you say that's how the Sephardim uh, bless somebody. Ben Porat Yosef. They say it's Ben Porat Yosef. What they really mean is not the Ben Porat just. They mean the Ben Porat Alei Ayn. Ayn Ara. What they mean by Ayn Ara really is that this is a vessel of Din. So when I say Alei Ayn, above the eye, what I'm saying is above Dan, above, above, above this Din. Is Ayn Ara true or not true? What is Ayn Ara really? It means that I'm making an impression when I'm looking at you because I'm moved by your negative actions. But just the same, you have to have an Ayn Tova. Ayn Tova means I'm moved. This is really the essence of Hasidic psychology, if you want, in the end. The bottom line is that about good actions, I should be moved. And about negative actions, I should be like Datilion, like supernal knowledge. I can see it. I know it's there, but it doesn't affect me at all. And that's the power that a human being has in his, in his hands. To use that and make it that when it's a good action, to see it and then to be affected by it when it's a good action, and the opposite when it's a negative action to just keep it where where it's safe and sound in my mind and that's it intellectual knowledge. And he says so the final sentence is that if you yourself are able to exercise this uh, 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 limiting yourself, not to be affected by the negative, okay, you look at something and you're not affected by it, you're pushing back up into supernal knowledge also by Hashem, and it prevents the punishment. That's what's called sweetening the judgment. Taking it back up to the higher knowledge. Okay. Ten seconds, sorry, yeah. Even we're very late. The Freya de Carilla's wife had a brother. And the brother came with his wife to Ru- to I- America from Russia. And the brother passed away, were leaving a widow, a young widow who spoke no English, only Russian, and no children. So she decided she was going to go and live in Yerushalayim. And in the 1950s, Rebetz and Chaya Mushka used to phone up every single Friday. Like 50 people. Huh? 50 people every Friday. 150. 150. I told you this story about the... Tell, tell it again. No. So she used to phone her up and say the following words. I phoned to wish you a good Shabbos and let you know that somebody cares about you. Somebody's thinking of you. So can you read the caring and thinking does have a physical okay. effect. Huh? Thank you very, very much for living with me. <laughs> it makes a difference to my whole day, you know that? Oh, that's for mine too. Borgeshen.